Okay, this is the fun part. We get some farmer perspectives. Cam Nicholson is going to tell you about his on-farm ESG journey. Now, Cam wears a million different hats. I know him from so many different um, lines of work, really. Um, but he's also a farmer um, and has a 400 hectare beef and sheep farm um, in the Bellarine Peninsula. Um, and he's the director of Nikon Rural Services, a consulting business near Geelong, um, which also works with grazing and cropping uh, industries. Um, he provides advice to farmers and lectures on animal and pasture systems at Marcus Oldham as well. Um, and his most recent work focused on understanding and discussing risk in farming businesses and carbon accounting decision making. We've had Cam present to a few Rib Plains events. He's a fantastic speaker. Um, so I'll hand you over to Cam now um, to share his experience and um, please, um, what do you do? Clap <laughs> or something? Yeah. I don't have to clap yet. I don't know who picked my picture in the, the little thing, but I look very young there. So <laughs> it's very flattering. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for the invite. Um, what I'm going to talk about, and I called it our on farm ESG journey because it wouldn't be fair because Fiona and I farm together. In fact, Fiona does the day to day farming on our place um, while I'm out doing these sort of events and things like that. Um, and background to us is we're both ag science trained. Um, so you'll see a lot of stuff that I talk about and it's got a lot of data associated with it. That's because we understand data and we're comfortable with it. And I think that's one of the big challenges from a farming perspective and the farmers I've worked with is this data management bit and this data collection bit and just how you use it. So I'll touch on that anyway. A uh, little bit of background, we have beef cattle and sheep. The beef, um, we turn off steers to the long fed um, feedlot market. So there was a mention of stockyard, um, hearts at um, the Kirwee stockyard um, feedlot. We sell to them and we also sell to Rangers Valley up at Glen Innes. Um, highly marbled beef that goes into the Japanese market. And we also have wool sheep as well. So, a little bit of background. What's ESG to us? It's pretty simple. It's just about best practice farming. And I think that's been mentioned um, several times already today. And it's an evolving space. You know, what I look back on what we used to do 10 years ago and what we do now is different. Okay? And I think the way we treat ESG is just something else that's come in and it will keep rolling and keep changing over time. But there are some useful signals that we use around that. First of all is understanding what sustainability programs are popping up. So Jess mentioned the one about the Greenhams. Anybody involved in Never Ever? Yeah, a couple of people are, we are. Okay, been signed up for that for a few years. They're good indications of where they're recognising where markets are at and where they see opportunity for markets. So using those sustainability programs will give you a good heads up on what the demand, if you like, or what the expectation is um, evolving. The second one is, is obviously legislation. There are things you've got to do for IHS. You know, you just have to do them. There's animal welfare things that you have to do. Okay? I bundle that in our ESG program. The third one is just listen to the chatter. You know, the regen, uh, the regen ag one just does my head in at the moment because consumers want it and love the word, but the definition of it is pretty loose and some of the things, some of the practices associated with it are not sustainable. I'll leave it at that. And then the last one that we apply in this is decency. Okay, now it's not one that you see pop up in a whole lot of the ESG sort of um, reports and things, but it's just how you'd like to be treated. If you're a shearer on the board, 35 degrees, stinking hot, having a fan on or having a fan available for you is quite nice. You know, so we think about all of that from that perspective. What makes the job easier? If you were a sheep going through a set of yards, would you want to be hassled or would you want to be led in a way that's easy and low stress? So just, I just, we just get apply decency to the way we look at running our business and what we do on it and the people we employ and all that sort of stuff. Now, it's been touched on as well, this requires really good data collection or evidence. And I think, as I mentioned, one of the biggest challenges is that we can collect a lot of data, but the data that we collect, while partly it's for evidence, more importantly, it's to drive our decisions. And there's too much data that's collected that I see on farm that people don't know what to do with it. And if you're a cropper, yield monitors and yield maps are just a classic of that. Got all this data, don't know what to do with it. 
you know, but it's got to be useful somewhere. It's not unless it drives your decisions. So I'm going to touch on that a bit more too. What do we measure? We have two broad pillars. One is what I call around the production system and I'm just going to very quickly touch on what we do. First of all is the feed production side of it, is an important part of our, our pillar. Okay. Second one is the genetics side of it, um, really important. Third one's animal welfare, shade, shelter, protection, all of that sort of stuff, super important to us. And the fourth one is that um, people and profitability side of it. And I'll just do one slide on each of those four areas. But th those four things we bundle together and say that's part of driving our production system. Feed one I've got up there, the rest is easier if they have a full stomach. I can tell you being able to achieve a whole lot of these other ESG things is much, much easier if you've got lots of high quality feed in front of you. So the way Fiona and I split up our business is I look after growing the feed, having the water standing the fences up, and Fiona looks after the livestock marketing side of it. Seems to be working all right, we're still married 30 odd years later and still get on pretty well. Um, but being able to grow feed gives you the flexibility to do a whole lot of other things in a livestock business. What does that mean? You've probably seen lots of figures on you know, pasture growth rates and stuff like that. We've gone down the next level. I need to understand the volatility of that pasture growth every month. Because I can tell you, you never farm to the average. We get lots of information sent to us on the average. You never farm to the average. You farm to the extremes. And the extremes are where the risk is. So if I've got to manage feed supply and understand feed supply, I've got to know how volatile that is. Also I need to know where the animals are, how long they've been there and how much they're eating. So we use this, we use mobile, but there are lots of programs now that allow you to understand where your animals are on the farm at any point in time and then give you the records of which paddocks are more productive than others. We also got an OptiWay thing, I don't know if people are familiar with that, it's where the cattle, you leave it in a paddock, the cattle walk on, put their front feet on it and it gives you a real time weight of how those animals are tracking so you don't have to bring them into the yards. We also use satellite monitoring, high resolution satellite monitoring because I need to know how much feed's there um, as part of that and we also have soil moisture and temperature probes in. Why? Because if I bundle all of those things together I can understand how our production system's working and making, make decisions accordingly. So when we start thinking about you know we should be monitoring ground cover and stuff like that, ground cover is a product of getting that right or wrong. Okay, that's the bit that we focus on. Ground cover will look after itself, okay, as the end point, as far as that goes. From a genetics point of view, we performance record all our animals. Um, so we're, a, we're involved with Tamania Angus, which is a, a beef um, stud. We're a progeny test herd for them, which means that we help them in collecting a whole lot of data. Um, we use ESBs and, uh, sorry, um, EBVs and ASBVs, so the EBVs for the cattle and the ASBVs for our sheep. We're involved in breed plan, which is performance recording, so we know our higher performing animals from our lower performing animals, and we use that as part of our, our culling and selling program. And we also use um, RAM Select, so genomics, to, to start to work out now how our animals are performing and where we sit. So we have got records back from, this is 2002 here, of how, for example, intermuscular fat, which is really important for our market, how we're tracking compared to breed average and how our performance is going. And that's 20 odd years of data. And we've got things for things like fibre diameter, clean fleece weight and stuff like that for our flock compared to other flocks in, in databases. All of those bits of information that we're doing to drive that from a productivity point of view, you find are recognised in the ESG stuff that's coming out. So our focus is on that productivity and we get the bonus of tying that in with the ESG stuff. Animal welfare, we stick to the code of practice and just the five freedoms. So if people aren't familiar with the five freedoms, I'd suggest you download them. But basically what it means, if it's something like uh, health, it's around vaccination and drenching programs, biosecurity, pain relief, all of that sort of stuff. So we do all of those sort of things, but that's a really good guide of if you want to get your animal welfare right. And if you're driven by that, then when you look at the ESGs that's required, you'll tick all the boxes. We're doing it for that reason, not because of an ESG program. We have two vets. We've got an advisory vet and what I call the operational vet. The advisory vet keeps us up to date with the latest stuff that we should be on about. 
the operational vets when you've, we need them to help pull a calf or something like that. Um, so we have two vets as part of our, our sort of system as well. From the people and profitability, obvious things. One is if we get hurt, we're in strife. So Fiona goes around, catches the calves uh, every day at birth, so when they're born, okay, their performance recorded, so they're weighed, they get all their vaccinations and other bits and pieces, ear tag in, know who mum is, all that sort of stuff. Trying to do that, run after a calf and jump out of a ute and grab it by the tail and trying to put it up on a set of scales is pretty hard work. So we have something like a calf catcher there. We have now both our sheep and cattle have all gone to auto weighing, auto drafting. And you can see in this shed here, uh, this set of yards here, we've also got a shed over it. It's far more pleasant to work on a hot day or a cold day when you're undercover. I can tell you, it's absolutely fabulous from that point of view. Um, we do all the financial recording and bits and pieces there, which I'm happy to talk about later on if you want to. Um, but this is one that I think is really underdone and this is one of my pet topics. And that pet topic is around decision making. We have about six key decision points during the year. Okay? And we have the system set up where we can go through and it helps drive our decision based on information that we need. This one here is do we sell this mob of animals or, or feed them and hang on to them? Okay. No. Decision making, you think about the last six months, of what people did with El Nino La Nina <laughs> announcements and all that stuff, and then blaming the Bureau because they sold animals and the market crashed and all that sort of stuff. Okay, We've got all this set up beforehand. This is part of our ESG program, takes the stress off us as far as the decision making that we need. And importantly, once we've got these decision frameworks in place, we know what information is important to us and what bits are just noise. So we don't chase the noise, we subscribe to the things that we need the information for. All right, so that's the first of our pillars. The second of our pillars is around the natural assets that support that production system. So one's focused on production, this one is about the natural assets. So we deal with soils, water, biodiversity, and our carbon footprint are the four areas that we, we focus on. First of all, from the soils, we're mad on soil testing. I started off 40 years ago, nearly 40 years ago now in the Department of Ag, and my first job was to interpret soil tests. So it's sort of in my blood and I can't get rid of it. Um, but we sample every paddock on the farm every three years and have for the last 30 years. So we have a database that used to, we used to do that, that took a day to do. I've now put it on a little massive 35 tractor so I can just drive around with my GPS and just punch holes and I do that much, much more pleasant. Um, and it's all GPS as far as those points there. So we go back to the same sampling points each year. Okay. But that allows us to do things like this is our phosphorus level across the farm. Back to, nine, well, 1990 is on here. It's fallen off the edge of the graph there. But we can actually track what our nutrient levels are. And I can now adjust that so I can stay in that band that I'm looking for. So not too much, not too little. Okay? That's the sort of thing ESG is looking for. Okay? Prove that you're not mining your system. Prove that you're not over-fertilising. There's the proof. Okay? Something like that. Um, we played around with some of the biological testing. I don't know if you can see those two soil cores there, they're 15 centimetres apart. I've gone away from the biological soil testing because those two samples had 30% discrepancy in the results from a biological point of view. So I've got enough biological tests at home to tell you anything you want to prove. If you want to prove it's good, I've got tests to show you that. If you want to prove that it's lousy, I've got tests to show that as well. Okay. So gone away from the biological one, which is a bit of a problem because some of the ESG stuff is now particularly under the regen banner, talking a lot about biology. It's a very difficult thing to measure. And that one's completely dropped off the screen. We've baselined our soil carbon down to a metre as well. So we have an understanding of where that is. The important thing out of that one is we're about 90 to 95% of what our maximum can be. So it gives us some really useful information about how much do we chase that last five or 10% of soil carbon and put all that effort into it and all the risk with creating credits around soil carbon when we're 90, 95% of the way there anyway. Okay, but the data's driven that decision. Um, water quality, we have three big dams now on the place. The whole farm is reticulated water supply. Our tanks, most of our tanks are concrete because that helps in fires. Um, if you've got plastic tanks, you can lose those. So we have a number of these 50,000 litre tanks around the place. Everything's reticulated as a water supply system with backup in it as well. Um, 
all fenced off, so no stock get into it. We do have dilemmas at time. 18 months ago, people pr probably remember it was a really wet spring. Remember that, 18 months ago? A huge amount of organic material that had accumulated over 20 years went into all of those dams and we ended up with a black water event. Killed turtle, turtles, um, frogs, eels, yabbies, everything. Okay, and it's only just starting to recover again. So we've done all the right things, lost all that biodiversity. If we had a biodiversity audit, it would look bloody awful. Okay, so there's a risk sometimes of saying these are the indicators you should have because stuff happens, which is beyond our control. In fact, we think we're doing the right thing and we get a, a perverse outcome as part of it. Third one is our biodiversity. Chuffed about these. We, we, Fiona, when she first started, she's a bit of a birdo and she got the Geelong bird observers to come out and we recorded 40 species on the farm. We've got 140 now, okay, over the 25, 30 years that we've farmed. And some of these really grouse things, like the, you know, the turtles and the, the bats and the um, echidnas and stuff like that, they're just appearing because we've created an environment. And if we're able to capture some of those positive results that we're getting, that feeds in neatly into some of this ESG stuff. Um, <coughs> that one you can't see very well, that's a lump of soil, it's got heaps and heaps of earthworms in it. Okay, so there are a number of indicators that we can use from an environmental point of view which help in that um, understanding of where we're at. The one on the top right you can't see, um, this was a, a trial I was doing actually for the satellite monitoring and calibrating satellite monitoring and I was out there cutting these plots and every time you put your hand down you got covered in ladybirds. Okay, and when I looked at it in detail all these ladybirds were chasing the uh, blue-green aphid. And you could just see them running up the stem and eating these aphids. It was absolutely cool, okay? Reason why that was all happening is because we created the right environment for it, okay? As part of that, that story. And the last one, our carbon footprint, there's been enough, I think, Hammond on this morning about, or this afternoon about the carbon side of it. The only one I'll show you is this one, which is our focus in all our carbon stuff is on what we call emissions intensity. That's basically how efficiently are we turning off product for the amount of emissions we're producing. So we're not worried about total emissions, we're worried about how efficiently we're producing our emissions. Because while there might be goals to be carbon neutral, there's no way our business can be carbon neutral. Okay? But what we can do is try and be as efficient as possible. And in the short term, if you look at where a lot of businesses are and in the supply chain are positioning themselves, they're positioning themselves to be wanting to buy from low emission suppliers. So what we heard about from the grains point of view, what Jess was talking about, is all about that emissions intensity at this point in time, not carbon zero, particularly up to 2030. So that's what we've focused on. So this is an example here because, as I said, we're nerds and we keep a lot of records. This is our emissions intensity. This is just for the beef bit of the operation. So how efficiently do we produce a kilo of beef? kilo of live weight. That's back to 2006-07 because we had the records and that's the kilograms of CO2 for every kilo of beef that we turn off. Okay, And you can see that that line that we've got there was up around 14, we're now sitting around about 9. Okay? Sorry. And if you look at the beef sustainability framework that was talked about today, their benchmark figure is about 12, so that's up about there. And if Jess isn't here, but Greenham's one now for their tier three that she spoke about, which was the highest level of accreditation, is about nine. It's 30% below the Australian Beef Sustainability Framework number. So that's about nine. So for the last six years, we've been sitting just below that. Okay. Now for them, we would make tier three. Okay, we're in the Never Ever program, but if we went to the other one, it's only that we don't sell many cows that, this way, um, but we'd satisfy that. We've focused on being efficient in our farming business, not because we wanted to meet Greenham standard, it's just we meet Greenham standard by doing things well. Um, and then on the flip side, we've been covering our uh, net carbon emissions. So this is our place here, we, we're down here as well. People would see that, that's Swan Bay and then Port Phillip Bay in the background there, so we're right on the, pretty well right on the coast. This is our place going down there. We've planted all those trees in the last 30 years, 30 odd years. One of the downsides is in planting all of those trees when you model from 1980 how much carbon have we captured in those trees per year, we peaked in about 2015. 
And because as those trees mature, we're capturing less carbon all the time, our actually carbon capture is less than if we're starting from scratch. So one of the downsides, I suppose, in something like this is getting some recognition for trees that you've already planted or carbon storage that you've already been doing uh, for the stuff that's going forward. So where do I see the challenges in all of this? So what I wanted to do with those previous slides was just show you a bit of a snapshot. That's where we're at in our business. But we've been driving all of that, as I said, to be more efficient and enjoy farming more and make more money out of it rather than driving it because someone said there's an ESG program we have to meet. But we're meeting a fair bit of that. So where do I see the challenges? The first one is unrealistic and unsuitable indicators or expectations. And I put the regen practices in that because I've seen some of those regen practices and I've gone through them and I think this is just ridiculous. This is not good science behind it, but somehow you've got to tick that box if you want to get the label. Okay? And so the expectations of what you can actually really do on a farm um, that you see in some of these ESG programs is a bit beyond the pale. So things like, you know, I see some of them that say you need a positive biological trend in your soil. Now I know enough about the testing, probably a lot more than the people that wrote that, to say that that's a really dodgy one to build on. Okay? And the other thing, particularly with something like soils, we agriculture in a biological system operates under the rule of the law of diminishing returns. You get to a point where you can't get any more. If you're already towards the top, where do you go? If we had an ESG number that said we want your soil carbon to increase by you know, half a percent a year and we're near full capacity because that's all our soil will take, where do we go? So some of these ESG numbers need to have a reality check on them, some of the expectations, okay? Um, and I've got do-gooders in there. You know, there's <laughs> and I'll put that up because we've actually got something now that's rare and endangered on our farm that wasn't there 30 years ago. Because we've created the habitat, it's come back. It's been verified by a few sneaky people to say, yep, you've actually got something really special. We're reluctant at the moment to shout that from the rooftops. Why? Because then all of a sudden we get people coming in to say, this is the way you have to manage that to protect this species. Okay? So from a farm point of view, while we're excited by it, we're just going to keep it quiet and we're just going to keep doing our own thing because, and I've had experience in other farm areas where that sort of happened, pristine areas that now people want to come in and, and tell you how to run it because you've got something special that you may have created because of your management, but they'll tell you how to do it some other way. Second one, inaccurate remote data use for verification. So a few of these that, that try and take the burden off individual farmers collecting stuff, they want to do it through remote, remote type stuff. So you saw the trees in our place. If you use the remote sensing that the Australian Beef Sustainability Framework's been kicking around, it only picks up a third of those trees. So where would it put our farm? Our farm has a third less vegetation cover than what we've actually got. Now, if that's the measure we're going to use on that, then that disadvantages us. So data that's used for verification. We've got another one where it says, oh, these are really important biological areas next to our farm, they don't exist, haven't existed for the last 50 years, but they're in the same category as a very pristine native vegetation area that's 10 k's away. But because the GIS layer says that they're all the same, the expectation then is you've done something to that place because it doesn't exist anymore. It hasn't existed for God knows how long. So there's a real challenge here about making sure that the data that we're using is good. Second last one, getting too far ahead of the game, we've just accepted this. You know, we've planted all those trees, we've done a great job on that. We can't create carbon credits out of those for uh, accues and offsetting because they have to be new. Even though they're still accumulating carbon for the next 30, 40, 50 years, we won't get any recognition for that at the moment through an accu scheme. We might on insetting though, as was mentioned earlier. And the last one is that there is a business cost with all of this. Handling data has a business cost. Okay, um, so the documentation, you just got to do the documentation. Now I'm a bit of a nerd on it and we still struggle with it. Okay, this idea of auditing versus self-assessment. You know, people will want independent verification of that and I reckon that's a real challenge. 
and I've got there with insufficient reward. If the only reward for some of this stuff is you will get market access and someone else won't, I don't reckon that's good enough in the supply chain. I reckon if we've got some of these expectations to drive in that direction, there has to be the incentive. So I was delighted by the cargo stuff. I was delighted by what Jess was saying because I think that's the right direction and way to go. But there's a lot in the supply chain that just think we'll give you the privilege of buying your product if you meet these criteria. It has a cost, okay? And we need to address that as well. And that'll do me, Sarah. Thank you.